Good morning. And the Lord be with you all this morning as we gather together. It's good to be in the Lord's house. Good to hear the conversations taking place uh, prior to the service. Always great to be together, uh, together as God's people. And certainly a most happy Father's Day to all fathers out there this morning. We're so glad that uh, we can celebrate this day and uh, give God the glory for what he does for us. And as he leads uh, fathers in their families as they lead their families in the Lord and uh, we're going to pray uh, giving thanks to God in our prayer of the church today for that for the gift of fatherhood welcome to those watching on Facebook live we're so glad you're also along with us this morning God's blessings to you as you hear God's word proclaimed and as you receive God's gracious gifts through his word today a uh, few announcements to make. As always, we encourage you to fill out the welcome cards. One of these days, that those cards will be back in the pew racks. We're not sure when they'll be back there, but uh, we're, we're still doing steps towards uh, full normalcy, if you will. So uh, eventually that'll take place. But until then, if you have a chance, do that. Put them in the boxes. That'd be great. Uh, Portals of Prayer, the latest editions of that uh, devotional is, uh, and the today's light are now on the tables at each, ent at each, each entrance to the church, so please pick up a copy. Uh, VBS uh, meeting coming up tomorrow night, uh, 6 o'clock p.m. Uh, for those who volunteered or who would like to volunteer to help out with VBS. Uh, we are still in need of volunteers to make our Vacation Bible School a success. And that's going to take place uh, July the 18th in the evening uh, for five days. So uh, consider helping out if you have not uh, done so already. I'm sure it will be a success no matter what. If always Things always come together and God is glorified. And especially not having VBS last summer uh, should be a great, great blessing uh, this year. The 2021 annual Concordia Publishing House Bible Sale is here. If you'd like to order a Bible, there is a large order form on the bulletin board at the east entrance. So check that out as well. The Concordia Self-Study Bible is an excellent resource uh, for all lay people, for that matter. It's great. It has a lot of good notes in there. Um, so I'll encourage you to consider that if you don't have a, a self-study Bible. It's very helpful in your daily Bible reading. Uh, today's uh, service uh, is going to be based on divine service setting number four in the hymnal. It'll be on the screen, of course, as well. And our hymn of invocation is the hymn, Lord, open now my heart to hear, hymn number 908, hymn 908. If you are able, I invite you to please stand for our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand?
since we are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We pray. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our intro for this day, based on Psalm 107. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people, and praise him in the assembly of the elders. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your mercy, guide the course of this world so that your church may joyfully serve you in godly peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated for the scripture readings.
The Old Testament reading for today, the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, is from the 38th chapter of Job, reading verses 1 through 11, and our Old Testament reading will serve as the basis for the sermon this morning. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle is from the sixth chapter of Second Corinthians. Verses 1 through 13. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affection. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the Alleluia in verse and the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even wind and sea obey him? This is the gospel of the Lord. And now we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. 
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We continue now with our sermon hymn, Evening and Morning, hymn number 726.
grace, mercy, and peace be unto each of you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God today to which we give our heartfelt and devout consideration is our Old Testament lesson from Job chapter 38, verses 1 through 11, and I'll be reading that text here in the sermon this morning. This is God's holy word, and my dear brothers and sisters in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're so smart, then tell me this. Have you ever heard those words? Usually they come out of the mouths of little children when playing the game of one-upmanship. You know how it goes. One child said that says that he's far ahead of the rest because he's been there, done that. Well, that doesn't sit too well with his classmate who then says, well, if you're so smart, then how come you got a C on the last science test? Or if you're so smart, why did you have to stay in for recess yesterday? If you're so smart. Our text this morning contains God's words to Job at the end of a lengthy discussion, dialogue, and even dispute between Job and his three friends named Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, plus a fourth by the name of Elihu. Finally, here in chapter 38, the Lord God speaks. His silence throughout the long days of Job's illness no doubt parallels the silence of God during some of our tough times that we may experience. At least it may seem as if God were silent, but God is not silent, not at all. And he proves that in the events surrounding our text when he says, and I read to you again now from our text, he says, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? God tells Job, and he reminds you and me as well, that he knows what he is doing. The Almighty Lord, who is eternal, who made the heavens and the earth, has a divine purpose in all things, even in things that we may not ever understand or things that don't ever make sense to us. Our God is so smart that we can trust him even when things are out of control. Now, you remember the events of Job's life, and it's good to review again what he had been dealing with up to this point. Job, as we know, was a man who was truly blessed by the Lord. He was wealthy, he had a beautiful family, he had good health, and most important of all, he had a strong faith in his Lord God. But that faith would be severely tested, and things would change drastically for Job when Satan, the evil one, began to take all of these good gifts away. His flocks were stolen, which of course were his means of income. All of his children died in a freak storm. His health would deteriorate rapidly from wretched sores that covered his body. They were so bad, in fact, that God's word tells us that to find relief, he would, have to, he would uh, scratch those sores with the shards of broken pottery. So he was physically suffering. Job's friends, who should have been there to comfort and encourage him, were no help either. Their greatest help to Job was when they sat with him for an entire week before speaking. But when they did speak, what did they do? No, they didn't encourage him. No, they accused Job of great and secret sins that were in their minds the cause of his suffering. It must have been some sin that you did, Job, and God is really mad at you. Job's wife wanted him to curse God and die. Be done with him. And for a while, Job did keep a strong faith. He didn't blame God or deny his provision and care. But eventually... Job began to waver, pleading to confront God and defend himself. Job protested his innocence, virtually ignoring the fact that all his sin and has fallen short of the glory of God. Yes, even Job 
But this is what Job says, trying to make sense of things, because he felt he was, he was living a holy life. Verses 5 through 8, chapter 31. He says, If I have walked with falsehood, or my foot has hurried after deceit, let God weigh me in honest scales, and he will know that I am blameless. If my steps have turned from the path, if my heart has been led by my eyes, or if my hands have been defiled, then may others eat what I have sown, and may my crops be uprooted. You see, Job is saying, I know my situation better than you do, God. I know I'm innocent. I know I don't deserve the circumstances I'm in. But then in our text, God says to him, if you're so smart, then tell me this. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? Or in what were its footing set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness? When I fixed limits for it, and set its doors and bars in place. When I said, this far you may come, and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. Those are questions that God asks Job, and they're, they're very good questions. But they're not just asked of Job, they're asked of you and me today. So we still can't answer them, even with all of the technological advances that have been made over the years. Just like people today, Job asks, where was God when that happened to me? And the Lord answers, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? If you're so smart, if you know better than me, then tell me. And using the two images of God, the creator of the land and the creator of the sea and that all that is in it, the Lord is telling Job that he knew what he was doing when he created all things. Job wasn't there, and neither were you or me. Everything the Lord designed was very good, perfect, in perfect order, since God is a God of order. The foundations were set. And then God uses the image of a midwife. He says, who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? God the builder, the midwife. Both images tell us that God knows what he is doing. He understands the master plan. He knows how things operate, whether he's building a home, delivering a baby, or allowing Job to suffer. Each of these images is designed to create confidence in the God who is speaking. You see, Job did not understand the complexity of God's creation from its vast dimensions to the intimate details of placing the exact limits of the sea. Job thought that he understood good and evil, life and death, but God, through his questions, reveals that Job didn't have a clue what he was talking about. We often like to relate ourselves to Job's suffering when we suffer in our lives. But we miss the fact that, like Job, we ask those same questions about our God, thinking that we have things figured out based on our own imperfect knowledge. When life doesn't make sense to us, when things are out of our control come upon us, and we want to stand in our own self-righteousness, we ask God the wonderful, the, the very well-known question, why? In the last three or so weeks near where I live, there's been two tragic car accidents, one which took the life of a six-month-year-old baby, and another the life of a 50-year-old woman whose 12-year-old daughter now is in the hospital, severely injured from that accident. We ask the question, right, why? Why? Or when the bills start to pile up, you know what it's like, and you're trying to make ends meet, and you're thinking you got everything figured out, and then a big thing happens or that's going to cost a lot of money. How am I going to pay for this right now? And you say, why, Lord? Or when a once rock-solid marriage comes to an abrupt end, when one of the two spouses walks out, leaving the other spouse devastated, 
And they were really good, solid Christians. They went to church every Sunday. Why? You see, none of those things, and you can name a bunch of others, I'm sure, in your life that don't make sense to you why they've happened, bad things that have happened. They don't make sense, not in our perspective. We don't understand why God didn't intervene, as if he's looking for a way to make us suffer. And we think that he doesn't care. Well, that, isn't, that thought isn't anything new. On the Sea of Galilee, after a long day of teaching, Jesus and his disciples get into a boat and begin sailing. A violent windstorm comes up, and the disciples, these, these guys who are masculine, you know, they know what they're supposed to be doing on this. And I th- talk about you dads out there. Yeah, we know what we're doing. We've got the answers. We can handle this. What happened to them? They're scared to death. They're, they're thinking they're going to drown. It was bad. It was a bad situation. Where was God? Where was Jesus? He's asleep. He's asleep, exhausted from a long day. And when they awaken him, what's the first thing they ask? Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? Don't you care about our lives, let alone your own life? What are you doing here sleeping? As if he was not, didn't care at all and was going to let them die. But you see, to make that accusation that God doesn't care, there's nothing further from the truth. For Job, for the disciples, and for us. Did you notice that God doesn't answer Job's questions? He doesn't debate with Job or with Job's friends. He doesn't even refer to Job's suffering. Instead, God raises Job's sight from his own troubles to the marvelous order that undergirds the world. He patiently instructs a man who needs to see the larger picture. Job is brought to contentment without even knowing all the facts of his case, that Satan had brought up the matter to bring upon suffering on Job and that God had allowed it. With limits, he said, he cannot take his life. Job has to operate by faith, not by sight. He has to love God for God alone. And God invites Job to love him for no other reason than that God is worthy of love. God invites a humble perspective that is willing to learn. He says, in short, that it's more important to know God than to have all of the answers, even if you're supposed to have all the answers. If you're the answer man or answer woman at work, the boss or the head of the house, fathers, even when you don't have all the answers, it's better for you to know your Lord in relationship so that you can lead your families in the same manner. Doesn't matter if you're the smartest kid in the class or leader in the church. You see, we don't have to have all the answers. And I know that might be hard to hear because we want to have all the answers. But we don't have to have them all because God does have all the answers. Even when things are at their worst, even when things seem to be out of control as it was or it seemed to be that dark day 2,000 years ago when it appeared that Satan had won. When the disciples had no no clue why their master was abandoned by the Heavenly Father to die on a cross. Jesus' disciples didn't have the answer, but God did. He knew what he was doing. Christ bore our sins on the cross that we might not die for our own sins. And we know that now through the preaching of the gospel, which we have the whole picture, Old Testament and New Testament. And unlike Job, with Christ's resurrection, we did come to understand God's reasons. Our salvation and his disciples and Job's. Well, how does the book of Job end? Well, in chapter 42, verse 5, Job says, I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. Well, today you and I have once again met with God. We're meeting with him right now. God is present in his word to instruct, comfort, rebuke, correct, and train in righteousness. He's present in the the gathering of believers. Wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is with us. He's present in the sacrament, the very body and blood 
of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper. He invites us to learn with Job that we need not have all the answers as long as we have God. We need not know why certain things happen as long as we know that he loves us in Jesus Christ. Many years ago, not long after cars were invented, a man's Model T Ford stalled in the middle of the road. He couldn't get it started no matter how hard he had cranked. And then a chauffeur limousine pulled up behind him and a wiry, energetic man stepped out from the back seat and offered his assistance. After tinkering for a few moments, the stranger said, now try it. Immediately, the engine roared to life. The well-dressed benefactor introduced himself. I'm Henry Ford. I designed and built these cars, so I know what to do when something goes wrong. Well, God as our creator knows how to fix our lives when they're broken by sin. He may not do it the way we want or expect, but he does it. He did it, especially when he gave his son to die on the cross for our sins. And that, dear friends, is the larger picture. That's the teaching we can always trust because he knows what he's doing. To God be all the glory. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all of our human understanding, guard our hearts and our minds through faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We stand and sing the offertory, Create in me a clean heart, O God. In our prayers this morning, we want to remember those who are, of course, suffering any illness of the body or who are hospitalized or uh, in, in care at this time. We pray for Diane Labs, who had surgery on Friday, knee replacement, and uh, also for uh, Paula Marks, who was hospitalized and now is uh, rehabbing at uh, Eden Meadows. We also want to give thanks to God on behalf of Paul and Connie Belter, as today they celebrate their 40th wedding anniversary. So we'll have that prayer uh, right before the conclusion of the prayer of the church today. So with that, we pray to our Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your steadfast love and your wondrous works to the children of men. You hold power over wind and waves, sin and death. Deliver us from every trouble and distress and bring us at last to our eternal haven. Lord, in your mercy, God of our salvation, you have ushered in the favorable time and day of salvation through the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Support all your ministers, remove all obstacles from hearing and believing the word they preach. Let your grace be proclaimed through every hardship, struggle, and suffering, and encourage us by the example of many saints to consider ourselves rich and alive despite every opposition. For since we have Christ, we possess everything. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, open wide the hearts of Christians to one another, especially within the home and between neighbors. Let love be genuine, speech truthful, and patience constant. Let us commend ourselves in everything as those known by God's love and therefore unashamed to serve one another. Lord, in your mercy. God of grace and mercy, we bless you for all earthly fathers through whom you have given us the gift of life. Make them examples to us of your fatherly love 
and help them to proclaim to their children your mighty deeds in Christ, bringing them up in the nurture and instruction of the Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of all knowledge, you alone with the Son and the Holy Spirit laid the earth's foundations and set the limits and order of our universe. Bless all noble sciences that plumb the depths of your creation. Give students, professors, and researchers joy in their discoveries and humility before your majesty, that all at all times you may be acknowledged as the true God and judge. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you rule this world by your power. Give to our civil servants respect and recognition of your creation and its, and its nature. When they use the authority given them from above, let it be in accord with your good design for our world and not the corruption of sin, which they are to rebuke for the good of their citizens. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Father, you see that we are perishing, yet you bid us to set our fears aside and trust, you, trust in you for the sake of Christ, by whose blood we have received peace for our troubled consciences. We remember before you today the trouble, the hurting, the despairing, the anxious, and the grieving. Bless them and all who suffer in body, mind, or heart, especially be with Diane as she recovers from surgery, and Paula as she continues rehabilitation, and of course those whom we name before you now. Give them your peace, comfort in their troubles, and whatever relief you know to be best for them. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Lord, we join with the sons of God and shout for joy as Christ Jesus gives to us his true body and blood in the Lord's Supper. Let us not doubt, but firmly believe your words, that you who formed our world and its matter know well how to be present for us and our forgiveness in this sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord God, we rejoice today with Paul and Connie as they celebrate their 40th wedding anniversary. We praise you, Lord, for these years of marriage together for them and continue to ask that you bless the years to come as they again center their lives on you. Through every joy and sorrow that they share, may their love for each other increase, indeed as their love for you increases. Lord, in your mercy. These and whatever else you would have us ask of you, O God, grant to us for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Again, we remind you our offerings are received uh, in the back of the church uh, by mail or, of course, through PayPal. We continue now through uh, to the order of Holy Communion, beginning with the preface. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us in all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him, who overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given the only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. 
We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us, your Holy Spirit, that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
we continue with the Nunc Dimittis, please stand. pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated for our closing hymn, number 863, Our Father by Whose Name. Thank you.